Hello my friends! Today I'm going to be showing you how I painted this seascape scene with watercolor. If you would like to paint along, you are more than welcome to. I just ask that if you do post your final result online that you use the hashtag SarahBurnsTutor so that I can find you. Alright, let's get started! First I'm going to figure out where I want my horizon line to be. I typically don't like to have it directly in the center of the page, so I'll either move the horizon line slightly up or even slightly down, but in this case I'm going to move it slightly up because I want the focus of this painting to be m mostly just the wet sand. So in this case the sky is not quite as important as the lower half. Since there's a lot going on in here, um, a lot of times what I'll do is just zoom in to one specific area and focus in on it, but I like this overall view with the wet sand reflecting the sky and the rocks and everything, so that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to keep my sketch really light because I don't need it to be there for the whole painting. I just need it to get me started so that when I'm laying in my sky and my water especially, I know around where the rocks are going to be. It can change while I'm painting and, and almost every time I paint I change something as I go, but I really want to have a strong guide for starting this one because of the reflections needed in the water. The first thing I do is get my sky area wet and then I start dropping in color. And I have my paper tilted up at quite a severe angle so that a lot of it will run down the page and give me more of a horizontal cloud look. And I'm shifting colors between grays and blues and purples because overall I want the background and especially the sky to be a little bit more cool and muted. I've been having a lot of fun with exploring this idea of letting the sky or at least one area of the painting be very abstract, so letting go of pretty much all of my control, and then in other areas of the painting getting nice crisp details and leaning more towards realism. And as it begins to dry, I'll continue to drop in color, but keeping it pretty muted still so that it doesn't overpower what is going to be in the foreground, um, but really just to get a variety of cloud shapes in the background while still letting it do its thing. <laughs> And as that begins to dry, I can start to take care of any of the areas that are um, going over my drawing or like pooling up on the edges. Uh, it's kind of just a point where I'm babysitting the painting. But especially just getting rid of those hard edges so that it keeps the background nice and soft. And now that the paper's starting to dry a little bit more, I'm going to come back in and lay in some longer, more prominent horizontal clouds using just the remnants of the mixes that I had earlier for my sky. Now I do want to caution you if you're going to do this that it does depend on how dry your paper is. If you go in when the paper is a little bit too dry you're just going to get hard edges, but if it's too wet you could end up with lots of blooms and splotches. So it's important to kind of know your paper and for me uh, I've been using this Arches cold press paper for so long that I know the timing of it pretty well by now. Um, but if, if you're new to your paper, just do some tests beforehand. The next step is to do these distant cliffs. And I haven't waited for the sky to dry completely yet. There's still just a hint of moisture. And that's a good thing because it's going to mean that my edges of this cliff are going to be a little bit softer. You of course don't want to, your sky to be very wet because then all of this pigment is going to flow up into your sky, which we don't want. And I'm using very subtle colors here. I'm actually mixing my pyrrolene green with a little bit of my violet, so it's more of a gray uh, with just a hint of color. And if anything, you could just use a darker version of your sky and then if you need to come back with more color, just wait for it to dry and do another glaze. And as I get closer and closer to the water, I'm going to just slowly start warming up my rocks. So I'm adding a bit of yellow ochre, mixing it with my grays and touching it here and there and allowing it to bleed and flow. Because again, these background elements are not the focus, but I do want to hint at the fact that the light is catching those rocks just a little. <laughs> 
I like to vary my brush strokes from dry brush to wet into wet when I'm doing the rocks to give it a nice variety. And if you have no idea what I mean when I say that, uh, if you're brand new to watercolor, these are just some basic techniques that you're going to want to practice before you jump into doing a big landscape like this. And if you need help with that, I do have a bunch of beginner friendly watercolor and gouache tutorials over on Patreon and on Skillshare. So you can use my links below to get access to those for basically the same cost as a meal out. So if you'd like to level up your skills, go check those out. Now, there are a variety of ways that we could do this next part. We could paint the rocks first or we could paint the water first. I decided to paint the rocks first because I thought if there are any places on this painting where the water overlaps the rocks, it'll be much easier if I already have some of the rock color down. So I started with a pretty thin down layer of my rock color, which is kind of a mixture of yellow ochre and quinacridone burnt orange. Here and there I might also add blue into it to neutralize it slightly. By starting thin down, there's always room to improve the color by either dropping it in while it's wet or coming back with a glaze. So here I'm coming back with a slightly darker version of that same color just to test out my darker values. And I quickly realized that I didn't want to go in that direction, so I mo removed it before it started to settle into the paper. Instead, I moved over to the left side to start filling in these bigger rocks. And as I do this, I'm trying to be very careful not to overlap my new color with any of the dried pigment, because if I do that, technically I'm glazing, which means it will be darker and it'll be really noticeable, almost as though I was lining this with a thick pen or something. So keep a paper towel handy and you can pick up those areas that you accidentally overlap. I'll continue this color down to the bottom until it's all filled in and maybe even touch in some more vibrancy here and there because these are the foreground rocks and it's okay if they stand out a little bit more. And now for the fun part, let's do the water and the waves. This Air, this bit of the painting is kind of fast because I'm working very wet into wet and I want the whole thing to have a nice transition. So there's not really any point where I'm going to stop and it might feel kind of overwhelming when you, when you do this yourself, but I'll just talk you through how I do it. So I started off with my darker version of blue, which is my anthraquinone blue. And I even mixed in a little bit of ultramarine and neutral tint and even a tiny bit of phthalo green. This is just more of a muted blue. There's not too much vibrancy in it. I want it to be bl uh, darker blue because this that distant ocean is not reflecting as much or you can't see down into it. And as I move closer to me, closer to the viewer um, or to the beach, I'm letting the brush kind of dance across the surface and occasionally letting a little bit of the paper show through, which technically will be my waves. I'm also adding more and more turquoise or green as it gets closer to me because we'll see, we'll be able to see down into the water a little bit easier. So it's just a constant balance of loading up the brush with enough pigment and water and continuing to drag the color down towards us. Again, here and there, we want to make sure we leave a little bit of white space showing through for the, the waves that are breaking or rolling over. If there's a big section of the wave which is like rising up and rolling over, I tend to use a little bit more green in it because more light will be visible through that wave. Here I'm dragging some of the pigment back up into the area I already painted because it's drying pretty quick and I don't want any of the new brush strokes to compete with the old brush strokes. And if I if I don't do that, if I don't drag the pigment back up into it, sometimes I would end up with like a splotchy edge where I don't want it. As I get closer and closer to my shoreline, I'm going to move down into a slightly smaller brush so I can make some more delicate waves. And it is just a matter of being very careful with the tip of the brush to reveal some of that paper. And I also want to get some dry brush at this point because I want that speckled, watery, um, almost like reflective look on the water. Also here and there, I'm going to dilute the pigment a little bit so it'll be a little bit more muted. 
Uh, or I can add in a sudden pop of color or even a more brownish tone because sometimes when the waves are closer to us, we can actually see down into them and we can see rocks below, we can see sand and seaweed. Sometimes we don't really know what we see down there, but we can see a change in value or color. So I find that it helps to just break up the monotony of a big space of water by varying the colors here and there, as well as varying if it's reflective or if you can see the paper showing through at all. And before this water begins to dry, I want to come back in with a hint of darker blue where the shadows of the waves would be. So where the shadow, where the wave curls over, it often casts the shadow down on itself, or we can see um, a bit of shadow beneath the overall wave. So just by touching it in while it's wet, it'll kind of flow and bleed and still stay really soft. And now I want to drag the pigment towards the shoreline and as I do that I'm letting it kind of fade or um, I'm letting it be diluted, even grabbing some more water to dilute it down. Basically this is just going to mimic this reflectiveness of the water that's coming up over the sand. So I'm also going to start touching in sandy tones and still trying to get a little bit of dry brush and a little bit of uh, white showing through wherever there's like a wave or um, anything splashing. I know it's a lot and it does take some practice, but the more you do this, the easier it gets. And especially if you just take it little by little. I can't emphasize enough how much dry brush is your friend when you do water because then if you're using a hot press paper you might not get as much of this effect but I'm using a cold press paper which is nice and textured and by just letting the brush graze across that surface I get all these beautiful little speckles of white which looks like reflected light. And now as I come towards the transition from water to sand I'm going to start changing my colors a little bit. I'm going to shift it more towards grays, purples, and sandy tones. I'm using a lot of potter's pink in the sand, so as I get closer to that left side, you'll see that I start adding quite a bit of color and warm it up a lot. I want there to be a subtle transition of cool tones from the water to warm tones in the sand, because as it as the water comes up into the sand, it kind of saturates it and then goes back down and it continues that rhythm. So the sand closest to the water is more saturated and often appears darker or even has a different tone to it. And this is also the perfect time to start doing the reflections of the rocks or anything you're reflecting in the wet sand. So I start off with a kind of minimal amount of pigment. I'm just you almost matching the color of stones that I already had down and letting it fade into that color, that grayish blue I have down for the wet sand. One of my favorite color combinations for doing sand is potter's pink and English Venetian red. Sometimes I'll even add in a little yellow ochre to warm it up or I will add in a tiny bit of neutral uh, tint or ultramarine blue to neutralize it a little bit. Here and there I'll add hints of shadow on the water, so even if there's not an actual wave breaking, I'll add a line of neutral tint or uh, gray color so that it'll kind of break up that big area of reflection or water. Um, of course here I'm adding a shadow underneath the actual waves that are coming up on the shore which have a lot of the foaminess. And there will especially be shadows under these big rocks. At this point, I'm starting to think about my big rocks up on the left. So I know that there are a few layers of rocks, so some of them are a little bit further away and then we have a big one that's closer. And I want to figure out how dark I want to go or how warm I want to shift the rock color. I'm not going to use anything too intense in the rocks because the overall feeling of the painting is rather muted and a bit stormy and misty. So a lot of the high saturation is cut in half. In the distant rocks, I'm going to add some shadow to make the light feel a bit stronger and to separate them from the um, sky or the really far away hills <laughs> because otherwise they just kind of all blur together. So we need a little more definition there. And then as I transition into the middle rock and then the one that's closer to me, I'll add just a hint more saturation and contrast. <laughs> 
And this is where it kind of gets tricky because watercolor definitely has a color shift when it dries. So it'll be a lot lighter uh, or less saturated when it dries. So knowing your colors is really important. I was definitely struggling to figure out how dark I should go because I was still getting used to my new selection of colors. Uh, I think I filmed this back in August. But anyways, it was just a slow approach to the rocks by adding hints of grayish brown to yellow ochre and even trying a little English Venetian red here and there. And I was also playing with the idea of just doing dry brush, but then I realized I should probably lay in a solid bit of color and then come back in and touch color into it while it's wet so it kind of bleeds and flows and has a nice transition of color. However, lesson learned here guys, English Venetian red is quite opaque and it's very intense. It's not like cadmium red or anything, but it is a bright red if you let it just use its full saturation. <laughs> so when I laid it in here, I thought, oh, it'll totally just blend and flow and kind of uh, desaturate a little, but it never did. It kind of stayed the way it is when it was wet. And later on, like at the end of the painting, I regretted that moment. I wish I hadn't gone with such a deep amount of pigment in that spot. But again, lesson learned. Neutral tin, on the other hand, is a color that lightens up a ton. It's a grayish tone and it almost has like a purplish hint in it, but I love it. It's like my favorite gray and it lightens up a lot. So I'm a little bit more used to that. So I, here I am coming back in with another layer and I'm also starting to plot out the different facets of the rock and even some of the bigger cracks because later I need to come back in and define those a little bit better. And while I wait for that rock to dry, I start working on some of the other smaller bits. I can't work on the foreground rock yet because if I do, it'll start bleeding up into that rock I just painted. But it's fine because it gives us an excuse to work on all the other little details. Now when it's dry and safe to paint, I can start laying in the color on the foreground rock. And again, I'm gonna be a little bit more colorful here. And I'm also starting to think about where the big cracks and different facets are going to be. There is also going to be more light reflecting on this one. It's not quite in shadow as much. So as it's wet, the warm colors are wet. I'll touch in a little shadow and a little uh, neutral tint here and there to just break it up a little bit and also hint that there are some shadows, but nothing too crazy. And again, neutral tint dries pretty light. Using a script brush, I can get some really fine cracks in the rock, just using the same shadow color I already put down. And using the same color of the shadows that I added to this rock, I can start doing the reflection. It's a little bit weird because there's no quote unquote water visible in the foreground yet, on the sand anyway, but wet sand reflects light and color and it's really crazy when you start um, studying the photos of it. So even though there's no hints of blue on my sand, well, water isn't always blue, it's clear. <laughs> so even though we can't see it, there are gonna be some big pools of water reflecting the light. So I'm sticking with a deeper color and I'm just gonna start using long sweeps of it from left to right and I'm, go I'm being very uh, conservative with my placement or with my amount of line work because I don't want to overdo it. I also like to have hints of dry sand showing through here and there because, you know, I don't want it to be a perfect line or um, any big chunky shape that'll be too distracting. Here and there I'll touch in a bit of neutral tint or ultramarine blue just to change up the shadows a little. Uh, because the shadows are also going to be reflecting in that color. Once I'm happy with that, I can start adding all the other little details and I guess you could say imperfections. So there's always sand and rocks and all sorts of debris washing up on shore. And if you don't add that, it's fine. It's just that I like breaking up that space a little bit and also just getting more of that realism in any other any way that I can. So. I mean, I'm not going to go overboard and add like plastic bottles, although it's kind of ridiculous how much pollution is on the shore these days. 
but I'm going to do lots of little bits of seaweed, mainly just twitching my brush around and getting like little blobs here and there. <laughs> um, and yeah, just, just breaking it up with some color. Now I do have prints available of this over on my Etsy shop along with a bunch of other recent paintings and I've listed out all the materials and steps I used in this painting in a blog post up on my new blog, thefearlessbrush.com. It's my new hub for creative activity and geared towards helping artists along their journey. So thanks for hanging out with me today guys and I'll see you again soon.